One nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Public notification has been made. I've seen it. Um, does anybody have anything that they want to add to the agenda? We have one item. Okay. Hearing none, um, we'll go for the approval of the agenda. Um, do we have any citizen comments or inputs that are um, not on the relevant topic of the day, that are not on the agenda, that, that wish to be expressed at this time? Anybody know of anything? Okay. All right. Uh, okay. We're at the comprehensive plan draft. The intent of the day, and correct me, Rob, if this is wrong, was to review uh, any comments, questions that the commissioners might have as it pertains to the first segment of the comprehensive plan which is the comprehensive plan itself, as opposed to the atlas and the work plan. Um, we, at this point, it's it's just, there's no, it's not a final approval process, it's just a recommendation or comments that you have or clarification that you might need. Uh, with that in mind, why don't we just start at one end and work our way around? And if you have any relevant uh, comments you'd like to make or suggestions or questions, um, Mr. Merchant is here to respond. Why don't we start with you then, Cecily, if that's all right? Sure. Um, let's see. Page 31, um, when under C1 actions, they talk about, um, we'll see, not, maybe it's C2 or... Anyway, it's about having um, access fees or user fees for boat landings. And that seems to contradict other things in the document which talk about expanding and encouraging um, the use of recreational water related activities, whether they're kayaks or you know motorboats or whatever. So I, I guess I'd like to be on the record as sort of asking you to rethink that. Um, I guess it's the third bullet point on, on page 31. Um, pursue funding sources, grants, I understand that, DNR water, you know, blah, blah. And local revenue generating sources such as boat lander, boat landing user fees. So, I mean, I understand that, that, that county facilities um, would benefit from having some public-private partnerships or in a county recreational space, there might be a revenue generating asset, I don't know, water slide for the sake of talk, or tennis courts. But I somehow think the boat landings um, are very important, and I think it'd also be a nightmare to enforce. So that's my first point. Um, okay. Oh, you want me to keep going through my whole list? Um, well, let's give everybody a chance. Maybe right, that's what I thought. Let's I mean, go around one time and then come back. Great, sure, the absolutely. Time. Yep, so we're running out of time. Um, I had a comment on, um, let's see, E6, de develop a highly skilled and uh, well-trained workforce. Um, you know, in concert with the economic development and bringing more jobs, you know, to Beaufort County, this could work part and parcel with that. Um, but in addition to tweak and TCL, maybe add USC Beaufort and, and the bases. The bases have a transition assistance program um, that they run their members through that separate um, the military, whether they stay here or go somewhere else. We can in incorporate or at least get a partnership with DOD with that. Where was that in the document? It is 43. on page 43. Yes. I have marked on that myself. But Tweak is an outstanding uh, nonprofit organization that um, Connie Hip and Rob Bridges does a lot to help place separating Marines um, in the local community. So you're you're encouraging that they include that they, they broaden it. Yes, sir. Yes, okay. Did you get that? Rob? Yeah. And I, I wanted to just take a moment. Um, I think you all know Noah Krebs. Not yes. No. Meetings before. <laughs> um, and also, uh, Lindsay Anderson, who some of you may know is the sure. former planning director of the city of Utah. Uh, she's been working for us since, uh, since February. And Noah and Libby 
have done a lot to get this document to where it is now. You know, we've, we've done a lot of editing, but I just wanted to you know, bring recognition to them, but also they'll be tracking. What we're hoping to do is track all your comments. As staff, we will look into them, maybe uh, work with our consultant if there's some issues there, and then we'll come back with uh, some recommendations about you know, some comments may be addressed somewhere else. We may have that as our response. Some will, you know, many of them will lead to changes or edits to the document. But um, we'll, we'll, we'll provide a matrix that kind of tracks the process of all the comments we receive. So that when you're looking at a, uh, an edited document with all of our comments and the public comments, you can kind of see you know, well, what fed into it and, and how each of the comments are considered. Okay. So. Well, I was there when when she did the um, Beaufort, the City of Beaufort Code, and what a fantastic job her and her team did on, on putting that document together. And I will say on this one, I think this is a beautiful format. It's it's very user-friendly. I think it's just, it's it's a beautiful document. It's got some massaging that needs to be done, of course, but other than that, I think it's a great product. Thank you. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, the comments that I have, I've provided to you, Rob, so mm -hmm. if we don't get them to, to them today, and this is the case of all of you, if, if we don't get to everything today, um, feel free to um, send your comments, your written comments, to Rob. Mm -hmm. um, they will thoughtfully consider over the next 30 days, that's part of the process, uh, amendments, updates, etc., uh, with the consultant organization. Um, I, too, feel that the document was a groundbreaking for us in Beaufort County, um, a very um, well-written, targeted, concise, fact-based, um, not just the comprehensive plan that we're re asked to review today, but the attach documents that support it, uh, the data, the atlas I thought was outstanding. It made to, clearer to me, and I've been in the county 22 years, a lot more, give a lot more depth to the understanding of what exactly is the current demographic, psychographic, et cetera, condition of our county. And I think it is a, a fact-based document that then uh, gains, gives support to the comprehensive plan and the work plans that follow. Um, I'm hopeful that uh, you all have a chance that you will undertake, if you haven't, to read the atlas and the, the work plan. Uh, I particularly am pleased to see uh, the work plan, the who, what, when, and where on the major components, because a strategic plan without a work plan is a wish. And so I'm looking for what are the recommendations that go forward on the work plan? I, I noted that it was particularly, it wasn't fully developed. There were a lot of areas um, in terms of prioritization, in terms of uh, when we're going to do it, um, who's going to be responsible for it, and so on. And I'm hopeful that before it goes to county council, that those things are identified, at least in the recommendation form. Because again, uh, without that, specific detail, um, the plan becomes a wish. And I don't want to sit, see it sit on the shelf as a lot of strategic plans tend to do. Um, with that over, I'd like to make one comment of a general nature. Um, the maps from page 72 to 129 are, in my opinion, very busy and in some cases difficult to discern between the variety of colors, the blues and the greens especially, the progressive blues and progressive greens. Um, the larger maps are useful for the big picture context across Beaufort County. I think it gives you a quick snapshot. But I believe too that smaller regional maps behind the larger Beaufort County maps might reduce the very busy feature and improve the reading of shaded colors and be very specific to uh, council members and others who represent different regions of, of the county, the five regions that we've his historically portrayed in our documents. So that would be my, my first comment. Diane? I don't have one, I'm sorry. Okay. I read, I read it, but I didn't absor absorb it, let's put it that way. 
<coughs> Jason? I don't have anything to add either at this time. Okay. Kevin? What page maps were you talking about? Um, from page 72 on, and, and a very general statement from set page 72 to page 129. There are extensive amount of maps that are very busy. Okay. And um, I, I think um, it, it just a, a pen to that message is that people who will look at that can get dizzy and try and understand specific to their community what's going on or what the opportunities are. Um, that it needs to be very clear. And this is going to be a digital document. It doesn't seem difficult to add a regional mapping strategy. If it's a printed document, it gets a little more cumbersome to have five pages backing up those 20 or some pages. I had a specific question about the map on page 33, but I'll wait if you want me to wait. Well, it's your turn, so okay. go ahead. Yeah, I'm looking at this map on page um, 33, Robert, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering... Um, what is this telling me? Because I see, like, what are all the white spaces that are there? I understand that the dark green and yellow, and actually there's two colors being used for the same thing, unless they're different colors. In my Crayola 64 box, that would probably be the same. That's it. Yeah. Um, what this map is meant to show is that there's a, con I guess, a continuum of protection of sensitive areas that would go everywhere, ev everywhere from low density zoning down to full purchase of property. You know, low density zoning is probably the most effective and inexpensive way to, you know, to, to protect the future of property. Um, but when you have a very critical piece of land, you know, actually outright purchase is, you know, the strategy, it's most expensive, but it's the most effective if you want to preserve a piece of property. But this map is meant to map all of these, you know, the, the low density zoning uh, areas. Um, probably having that white and it being the same color as the marsh, maybe that's not the, the best. Probably, if there was a color for land, that would that was the other category, you know, that would probably be easier to read than, than the way this map is done now. Well, I guess um, the recent application that was on 170, where they were looking for a change in zoning, mm -hmm. I think that one comes to mind. And I'm looking at this map and I'm trying to figure out, you know, where, where about that is. But I see yellow, I see dark green, I see light green. I see no shading at all, and I'm trying to differentiate what what that is in that area. Yeah, and I think it's just the scale of the map. It's hard, you know, but that area, you know, that property is currently zoned rural, and one of the challenges with the rural zoning is that it, it prevents high density development, but it could be changed with the act of council, you know, or the planning commission. So, you know, that's. Well, I guess I, I view it differently. I think that now is the time, if there's people out there that have property mm -hmm. that they want to have re rezoned or believe it should be rezoned to comply with this document, now's the time to come forward with it and do it. Because, you know, we shouldn't, like, go through this whole process of this document and be sitting here six months from now um, with a zoning change request uh, that goes against what what this plan did, mm -hmm. and you know because then, quite frankly, it, it kind of puts the the property owner at a, at a big disadvantage because it, how do we change something that was just approved three months or six months before? I think it makes it very difficult for us and for county council um, to say, yeah, you got a valid reason to make this change. Well, well, if it was a valid reason to make the change, why didn't why wasn't it picked up in this document? I mean, that's that's the job of the planning commission is to, you know, every time somebody comes in for rezoning, you're weighing it against the uh, the conference plan that you know that, that we've approved, and you know, so I mean, 
you know, by state law, everyone has the right to petition for a zoning amendment. You know, we, we don't have the right to turn them down because we don't think it's a good request. But that, you know, it's, it then becomes the job of the Planning Commission to evaluate that proposal in light of the comprehensive plan. And, you know, I think that that, I mean, I, I agree with you that ideally it would be great to adopt this document and then have everyone, you know, everything happen in accordance with this. But people are going to want to build and we're going to have to grapple with that and make recommendations according to what's in here. So, does that make sense? So, Kevin, are you talking about up zoning or down zoning? Um, up zoning, in most cases, I will. You know, I'm just thinking about a couple of the ones that came before us, kind of recently, um, and I, I just keep thinking of that 170 corridor because that's how I drove up here again. And you know, it's kind of like a mishmash there. And you know, this this doesn't even reflect what's going on on the other side of 170 with a, a tremendous amount of growth and that's jasper county right the, yeah yeah the other side, side is jasper county <laughs> which you know obviously we, we we don't control but 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 it does impact what we do on this side whether we um i i just you know i just think that that this is the time that um you start to make some decisions on you know what 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 is that this is what it's in 2040. So what do we think that the 170 corridor is going to look like in 2040? All right? Because to to think that you can continue to just change the zoning of each individual project and then maintain a 50 mile an hour highway racing through there, it just doesn't, it's yeah. apples and oranges. It doesn't make sense. Well, um, let, let me make a distinction that seems to me is the, the, is the, the process that we go through. Um, the, the planners working with their uh, partners that they collaborate with, whether it be from Bluffton or whether it be from uh, Hilton Head or Buford or Port Royal, uh, are constantly in a discussion about zoning. And there, I understand, is part of the document, there are discussion, regional discussions on the 170 corridor. Um, and I know there are discussions going on right now about properties that are under consideration along that corridor. Um, I, there is a, a current zoning that's there. I don't know that it's the job of the Planning Commission to change that zone. Is that 170? Um, unless there is a specific request from a property owner to take exception to that zone. Um, I'm not aware that the process for changing seven. zone descriptions across the county right is really starts with the Planning Commission. Is that, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Um, you know, it, it could happen if, if we recommended, it, let's say, a large-scale rezoning of an area. You know, it, it could be initiated by the Planning Commission. Okay. If you're talking about, you know, the plan informing a zoning change that we're recommending, you know, you, and then bringing that through the council and asking for them to adopt it? Yeah, that's not, the process that we've been subject to is somebody comes with an exception to the, the current zoning. Yeah. But the zoning was laid down by in some process that's historic. And I would assume that that process is still in place. and. I don't know that that starts with the commission. Now, if we're looking at the comprehensive plan, which is just a recommendation, I think the recommendation is that they look from, Kevin, you correct me, that a, a more stringent zoning standard be established for the OKD corridor, evidencing all of the activity that's going on in there mm -hmm. across the region and up and down that corridor. Because yeah. con con we are constantly discussing and debating uh, exceptions to that as people are developing just in the last several meetings we've gotten into several I, I, I I'm not talking about stringent at all I'm talking about more um, down zoning well yeah but well just inclusive in other words you have to look at the whole the whole scope of what's going on out there because you have to say to yourself what what is this what do we envision this looking like in in 2040 or even 2030 for that matter 
Um, if somebody had an idea when they decided to put a 50, 60 mile an hour highway there, 170, between um, 278 and Buford, right? Somebody had an idea for that, all right? Does that idea um, correlate with residential zoning right off that? Okay, because what, what is gonna happen is if, if you continue, if we continue, and I'm not saying it's a bad thing, I'm just saying if you continue to have the development along that 170 corridor, then you have to bite the bullet and say, okay, what are we gonna do about the schools? What are we gonna do about the road? Okay, because you can't have a 50 mile an hour highway running through residential areas. You, you're gonna have to have lights, you're gonna have to have turn lanes, and um, emer you know for emergency vehicles, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's just a bunch of other things that you have to look at. You can't, we can't look at every single piece of property on 170 and say, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. not a bad idea that we change that zoning for that particular piece um, when no when everything else is not being looked at. I got you. Okay, and I'm not, I'm not pushing it towards up or down or sideways either way just that whatever it is that um that all the pieces fit at the end that you don't that you're not stuck with oh we have a great plan laid out here for all this oh and by the way there's going to be a 50 mile an hour highway running through the middle of it with no turn lanes and very little tiny service roads where people can even build a turn lane into some of these developments okay. um let me make a let me make a comment about the action that I see you suggesting. And correct me if I'm wrong. Um, as a result of this plan, the adoption of this plan, there should be an examination of all the zoning relative to what the recommendations of the plan, the adopted plan, are. And are they are the ones that are currently there legitimate, or do they need to be changed? And if they should be changed, should we be the planning commission, make be making recommendations as to those changes? Is that correct? Mm hmm Yeah. And I don't think... And I, and I agree with you 100% with what you just said. I'm not saying this just for 170 either. No, it's I'm no, sure this entire plan. Yeah. Yeah, and, and other areas, you know, like going into Ladies Island or any of these areas. Um, what is it that, you know, for example, um, I, I, I don't know, but let's say 10 years ago, you might have asked somebody what they thought the 170 corridor was going to look like, and they probably might, might have said, Oh, that's going to be a lot of retail up there. That's where that's where all the shopping is going to be up there. Um, but now that's not what we're seeing. Okay, mm -hmm. we're seeing some of that, but you're also seeing residential put in, and then somebody wanted to put an apartment complex. You know, you just start to see a hodgepodge there. I think that I think that's a a very good recommendation. Um, I don't know how we might initiate that process, but I would say in a subsequent meeting, maybe, uh, Robert, we could. Maybe explore how we go we go about that, and maybe what the big tackling the big issues first as it pertains to major corridors. I know there's a lot of discussion going on about the zoning in the Ladies Island corridor, mm -hmm. um, the Okatee 170 corridor, and, and others uh, that are building out like crazy along 460, uh, long of um, uh, Robert Small, not Robert Small, Gateway, Gateway uh, Paris Island Gateway. Um, they're, they're, I, I mean, I'm not sure how to, to do that, and I'm not sure we can do that at this well, meeting. And from a practical standpoint, that would be, could be very, very complicated. Yeah. When you start bringing in that many property owners and trying to change their zonings in the middle of the game, um, mm. I think kind of open yourself up for some uh, well, heavy, heavy criticisms yeah. and possibly lawsuits from people if you're, and, if you're changing you know, their I'll zoning. I'll just ask a general question. Right now, these properties are zoned rural, which is one dwelling unit per three acres. So it's very low density zoning. What are we suggesting is appropriate for that corridor? That was my question about why, why are we suggesting down zoning or up zoning because it's already zoned as, as least dense really as it can be unless it's strictly agricultural. Um, you know, and to down zone somebody's property, you know, you, you've made a financial impact on the value of the property and that's going to cause problems. Um, but 
Yeah, I don't think there's any. I, first of all, I don't think you could justify down zoning because, you know, one one residence for every three acres, you don't have a septic issue, you don't have a water issue. It would be no, and, and I'm I'm certainly not talking about that. But in other words, w one example might be: should this particular piece should it be mixed use? Should it be residential? Should it be commercial? Okay, um, and. Uh, E even if it was just laid out as um, uh, that, this is this is what this is where we would like to see this go. The property owners that they can they can stay with what they they want to have. Okay, um, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm thinking out loud, but well, it's it's a it's a good thought. Is is this plan? Does this plan indicate there need to be changes in any particular region or area? of Buford County as it pertains to zoning. And I don't know the answer to that yet. Um, so, I mean, I don't know how to, if we take that piecemeal or we take it in some big swaths. I think the areas that are, that are in need of some closer looks are the OKD 170 corridor. And I think those discussions are underway Oh, yeah. yeah, and actually the map, and I realize these maps are a little difficult to read, but the map on page 120 is a look at that corridor, and this actually comes from a joint meeting that we had with the city of Hardingville and Jasper County planners, yeah. yep. talking about where we would define future urban growth boundary, um, where the, you know, the lack of a better term, urbanization would stop, you know, and, and because we're, you know, we have Jasper on the other side. They look at this corridor very differently than Beaufort County. Um, you know, so we're, we're, we're looking at it from a, a broad scale, you know, of um, how far growth should, it, should go, where there should be little nodes of development. And it could be that that's something in the future, maybe we do a much more detailed area study of that corridor. But I don't know that that's something that's going to, that level of detail is going to come out of this conference plan. You I know, understand. We've, we've taken a lot of looks at that corridor. You know, we did the trans the traffic analysis that Elcog did with, um, with LATS. Um, but I think the same is true uh, in, um, in the Ladies Island Regional Growth Corridor. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of concern about uh, holding back some of that. Um, so I think these are ongoing discussions, but I think the clarity of that comes out in the comprehensive plan, which kind of sets the tone for what you want to do. So I that may not solve the issue immediate, but I think as long as we have identified that we feel that this document should be reflected in terms of its uh, desire to improve uh, the zoning as we go forward and look at our zoning. Okay, it, actually th this this is a much better map you're looking. So, okay, so if I'm looking at this map here and I see proposed rural crossroads, I see proposed hamlets, I see proposed villages, all right, that's enough there. I'm not talking about changing anybody's zoning, but that's enough there that the folks um, you, you, you have to look at now. You got to say, okay, so th this is what we see coming here in the future. All right, they're kind of circles there. It's not picking out anybody's individual property, right? But if if this is all going to come to fruition, right? Is is th is that roadway adequate? Is that roadway going to serve the community and also the commuter the person that's traveling from Buford down to Savannah every day? Are the schools? Um, you know, going to be adequate because that elementary school over there now is is filled to capacity. So if all this is going to come in here somewhere in the future, I, I'm just saying that these other things yeah. need to be included in here. And this is actually, I actually like the way this is laid out. This kind of shows it a lot better than that other one. Um, and, when, and I'm not even, I'm not talking about up zoning or, or down zoning at all. What I'm talking about is, okay, so this guys, this is what you're going to see here in the next 10 years. We're not saying exactly where, but it, within the, 
the, within the scope of those circles, you're going to see these different things. What page are you on? Uh, 120. <laughs> exactly, 120. It's actually a... Uh, okay, let's... Um, um, I, I, understand, I understand where you're coming from. Yeah. I, think, I think I said it. I make, you make a good point. I don't know the answer to the question about the 170 roadway. I know organizations like LATS are looking at that entire corridor from 278 on up. I know they've concentrated probably so far up to 462. Um, yes. And that study is in a little bit of a, a holding pattern yeah. because uh, not everyone at LATS agrees to the, yeah. but that's, that process is going on and I think that's answering some of the questions about transportation. It's not an easy question. No. And it's, it's, you know, it's, it's an expensive solution and there's a lot of different ways to do it and I think the current proposal involves a lot of U-turns and that's this, the town of Bluffton and city of Partyville are, you know, not really in favor of that and so it's been a little bit of a holding pattern. But yeah, I agree that the transportation question needs to be yeah. addressed. Final comment, um, I'm one of these pages, I can't find it real quick, but it shows the integration of multiple plans and it shows the transportation plan in coordination with other plans and um, the comprehensive plan and the, and the uh, muni plans, etc. cetera, um, that all have to be blended together. And it, this is an issue um, for that particular corridor as it goes through the municipalities and it's being studied by a transportation organization. Anyway, thank you for that. Cecily? Uh, I don't know whether to stick with, you know, policy, small bore or large bore, but I'll just, um, I guess I'll go to economic development. So um, that would be page 45, strategies and actions, um, about you know, encouraging a new development or relocating business development. This is just a question. Are there any EPA designated brownfield sites in Beaufort County? And I'm thinking of the area around Sheldon and the fight a couple of years ago over the jelly proposed jelly ball processing yeah. plant up there. And the um, finding is that the old factory in which this would be sited had effluent from the former dye factory. And that was one reason, among others, that the that position of the plant there, not the harvesting, which would have been on St. Helena but the plant there was denied. So are there brownfields? I mean, what, in Beaufort County, or I mean, maybe that's the wrong word, you know, environmentally ha hazardous sites that can be excluded from this kind of reuse, or are those federal statutes? Um, I know that that is a brownfield site, and that um, we have looked at it at different times in what it would take to get that cleaned up <laughs> and zoned properly, and. and you know, so that's something that, that's on our radar. We haven't taken any concrete steps. There are a lot of things that need to be in place. Community support, they need water and sewer, which is, you know, our policies discourage them from going into rural areas. Um, that's the one that I'm aware of. I don't know if there's some uh, contamination issues at the port property in Port Royal. Right. You know, okay. That would be a, yeah. you know, a town issue. Municipal, but, yeah. yeah. There's one more across from the air station. So there, there are a few. Yeah. The port wall landing, um, all that's oh, considered yeah, cleaned up at this point. Uh, yeah. Oh, that's right, with the phosphate down there by Spanish Point. Anyway, I just, I mean, if that, it, if it's appropriate for, for a line or two to be put in about, you know, um, that planning would, con would take into account um, not only extension of water and sewer, that actually was another one of my questions, mm -hmm. but of, um, you know, federal um, mitigation policies, and you know the county would be looking into it. I agree; it might be down the road, but it came up once, could come up again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. Thanks, Ed. For now. Um, On page sixty, I had a question about: um, Didn't we have a special working group that looked at affordable housing? Yes. So, have some of their recommendations been incorporated? I mean, this is these are great thoughts, but like the action. Um, they they kind of seem um, I don't want to say not specific enough, but just you know are are these really attainable? Because some of these are are far reaching and not within our our scope of decision making. Mm -hmm. So at a you know maybe at a fifty thousand level look, maybe we can look at 
more things we can do to encourage um, the development of, of affordable housing. I know there's you know tax incentives. There's there's um, other incentives for builders to build, but from what I gather um, from that working group, it just wasn't enough. It was the building codes were too specific, too expensive to bring the price down low enough to make it affordable for for everyone. I would like to change that ex expression. Then do not ever call them affordable okay housing. you know what this is what call it says it, in here call, i don't okay, care you know, what it says all right, well call anyway. it workforce housing because when i've dealt with the public not just here but when i live in other municipalities people object to having affordable housing in their neighborhood but they do not object to workforce housing it's a completely different it sits completely different with people because they're thinking, feeling this is these are people who are working as opposed to people who are just getting this stuff from the from and the I'm federal reading out government. of the document. Okay, I don't that, care what it says in the document. I'm talking about when you're dealing with the public. All right, don't lecture me. Move on, please. Okay, okay right, well, thank you. Those are my comments. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, yeah, um, there, there are more. I mean. It continues on page 62. Yep. So, and we um, did carry forward the recommendations that came out of that group. It led to changes to our housing chapter. Okay. And we carried those, those over yeah. here. Um, okay. But yeah, I agree. I mean, it is a complex issue. And, and it is. Um, you know, one of the things the county is focusing on now is a regional housing trust fund right. okay. to, to get some dedicated funding and identify funding sources so that we have better tools to, to, you know, to, you know, either leverage affordable housing projects or to, you know, purchase land to partner with a with a mm -hmm. developer. So, you know, we're, we're definitely taking steps, but it's it's a yeah. yeah I don't, county, it's a big challenge. I don't know a lot about it. I just remember when that group was stood up to study it. Mm -hmm. um, specifically, there was a lot of issues with. You know, trying to get the incentives, um, they almost seemed like they were out of reach. You know, there were so many stipulations on the building that, you know, to qualify for them. And that's, you know, that might be the first place, uh, it, you know, to, to work on to try to loosen some of those standards so that we can get housing that, you know, mm -hmm. that, that group of folks that, um, particularly that live here and then work you know, in Hilton Head, um, Bluffton area, yeah. and then having to commute those long distances. Yeah, and I think what we're finding is that, you know, sometimes incentives work. Um, other times, the things we're using to incentivize are taking away what we feel are, qual you know, the kind of qualities we want to see in a community. And so, um, you know, we'll be told by a developer that we can't possibly, you know, build affordable housing and have sidewalks on both sides of the street or, you know, or we need a density that is two or three times what the district allows. And so we're always having to balance those, you know, the other planning principles that are, you know, that are coming out of the plan on, on, on how we want future residential development to be. And I think that that's why we shifted, I mean, we're going to continually look at our incentives and make sure that we're not yeah. putting regulatory barriers to affordable housing. But I think that's why we're, we're moving to focus a little more towards what we can do to partner with people, you know, and, and kind of identifying what are the, because a lot of times the barriers aren't as much regulatory as they are. There might be a financial gap or something that makes it impossible to get housing to a certain price point. You know, well, because and part of the equation, I think, is, you know, the walkable neighborhoods so that they can walk to, you know, grocery stores, drug stores, mm -hmm. um, you know, that that complicates things more, too, because there's not a whole lot of those neighborhoods right now um, yeah. for whatever category of, of housing you want to talk about. So, I mean, I think it's a great endeavor and something that we should strive for. But, you know, how do we're still admiring this. You know, problem three years later of Absolutely. how to get this housing. You know, and I, I would love to see it come to fruition. And I don't, you know, I don't know enough about what the working group 
looked at, I just remember that it's been an ongoing. Yeah. Um, and the, you know, the the biggest thing is when I go work out at you know quarter to five in the morning, I can see these palmetto breeze buses leaving the islands, and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, these folks are leaving that early to go to their jobs, mm-hmm. and and what time are they getting home? You know, so. You know, I would love for them to be able to work and live in the same community, whether that's here or there. Uh, let me just append to your comments, because uh, uh, in 2019, uh, Bob Summer, the former PC mm-hmm. chairman, and myself worked with this affordable housing task force. And every item on here pretty much came up during those discussions. Um, it was dissolved in late 2019, at least that, that form of the task force, but. Many of the actions recommended in here were things that were that were laid out at that point in time. I would encourage, to add your point, that we reinitiate that task force and move forward on some of those things. I know uh, Eric Greenway was his intent to carry some of those ideas and suggestions forward mm-hmm. to County Council. Um, I know Eric has been leading the way for the affordable um, uh, the, the task force on the. Um, Land tr- uh, affordable housing That's land trust right. mm-hmm. action, and I know a recommendation from a consultant is due any time if not already been proposed. Um, perhaps whatever that it's contained in that proposal, be inclusive of you know comments be added to this document to strengthen the support for it because I think mm-hmm. that's the best. And there may be a timing issue because I think they're supposed to finish up their work in June. We yeah. may be able to. Mm pulled in some of the recommendations if they're, if they're you know different enough from what's what's already in here well they they've been a part of organizations in other cities where they've raised tens of millions of dollars as a result of that that could be put toward yeah and make a big debt in affordable housing that pure incentives may not be able to make a dent in um, and I would like to see those initiatives supported and carried forward mm-hmm. Absolutely. It's kind of a tough situation. I mean, and it's not that different than what we looked at at the MPC last night. You know, right. in order really, <laughs> there's no way around um, driving up density when when you start doing that. And then people, you get in this, especially in this type of community, you get a lot of pushback because people want the islands to look the way that they look now. Um, whether it's whether you're talking about workforce housing or whether you're talking about luxury apartments people just mm-hmm. they just don't want to see that type of rise in density so it's kind of an uphill battle it is well it's like you said it's all i mean even the folks that moved to bluffton in these you know beautiful homes and when they start splitting you know properties to put another structure they don't you know they don't want to mess up their neighborhood because that's yeah. not what they bought into and right. so you know you can't blame them but then you know there's this thing called property owner rights you know and so it gets sure. very complex <laughs> do you remember the gentleman that came in it was about a year and a half ago and he was looking for a um he wanted to up zone right he wanted more density i think it was on the way after ladies island if i'm not mistaken and um he was going to use the tim scott enterprise zone and the state um, housing um, whatever program they have for workforce housing it was in Burton yes okay Here, show if point you remember, yeah. he, he didn't you know he was being kind I um, thought but he really didn't even look at what the county had to offer. he felt yeah. that he no, he, yeah. he could build what he wanted to build deliver something to the community okay and still make a profit on it Yep. Okay, and he had to run it, I believe, for 15 years before it went um, uh, full, you know, a private market or whatever. That's correct. Okay? Yeah. But you know, so there's something that works, and then the guy tells us that he's this was his third project. He finished two other ones. Right. Okay, and uh, not being critical of other efforts, but other efforts are, you know, there's great PowerPoint slides and all this other stuff. But here's a guy that is doing it. He is providing housing for the community. He's providing jobs for the people that are um, b- buying the homes. He's providing business for the people who are selling appliances and furniture and, and things. Um, and he's making a profit. I didn't, the, the guy didn't look like he was starving to me. You know, he looked <laughs> like he was doing fine. So, I mean, there's something there that already works. Yeah. So, 
maybe it, we should be looking at that and saying, how do we piggyback on that and make that even better so that rather than this guy going to the state or this one or that one, that he's coming to us and that we're saying, hey, look, we're going to put all these pieces together and come up with a better, a better solution for everybody all around mm -hmm. and just be the facilitator and not necessarily, you know, get involved in the housing business or something like that. Right. And that's a very I mean, specific program. That's the low income housing tax credit program. <laughs> it's a federal, you know, reduction of tax credits or, um, or tax credit. And there are developers who know it's a very <laughs> steep learning curve. And the developers who build that kind of development specialize in it. And yep. So we typically get, you know, maybe two applications per year that are granted in Beaufort County, one or two, hmm. typically in Beaufort, Port Royal, and some of the nearby areas in, in, in Beaufort County. So, you know, I agree. I, that's a real effective program. The one downside, of course, is that period of affordability. It's 20 years. And that seems like a long time, but we're seeing a, a lot of um, low-income housing tax credit projects convert to market rate right now, especially in the Beaufort area. There's there's a number of developments. So, but, uh, Worth examining all ideas. Yeah. How many I agree. I mean, as much as we can work with existing programs like that, they're very effective, and the people who use them are, are very good at it. You know, oh, yeah. They, they yeah. All right, um, I'm going to offer a comment. Um, throughout the uh, document, the term social vulnerability index is used. Yeah. And it's explained quite clearly in the atlas, uh, referencing a condition that the CDC has, declares uh, in a storm condition, for storm conditions and disease conditions, um, as to the social vulnerability of rural or more uh, lesser represented areas. Um, I think it's incorrect to use that term when referring to the facilities and services such as schools, hospitals, EMS, police, and parks. I think throughout the document there's a theme of equitable. Mm -hmm. It's one of the three themes. Yep. Um, I'm, I'd much rather see a, a, an opportunistic term used with, with uh, improving social equity rather than social vulnerability. I think the term vulnerability can be offensive. Um, I, I preferred the term myself uh, to be uh, taking the high road of an opportunity to improve um, the facilities or services in, in remote areas that are not near those services. So my recommendation would be to examine the use of that term as it pertains to facilities and services and change it to something less, in my opinion, offensive, like social equity, which was consistent with the theme, one of the three major themes of the document. Okay. Yeah, and I think it, it's, it still um, communicates the concern. Yes. Uh, I agree. I think we need to talk to our consultant about making that. I think that, that should be an easy fix. Um, Diane, Jason. No, I'm good. Kevin? Um, I guess back to um, the, the, the comments before on the housing. Um, do we want to do we want to differentiate? Because they are two very different things. Differentiate between affordable housing available and um, workforce housing available. I'm not saying I'm not saying to um, to change it. I'm not, I'm just saying should we include both? What was the thinking? What think was the thinking by the consultant? We talk about it as a continuum of it's a continuum all the way from homelessness to um, working families, you know, who are looking for housing at the at the median range, you know, median income. And so, and I'm trying to remember. I know we addressed that in the former plan, but I want to make maybe make sure that we you know make that clear because affordable housing is a really broad term and it means everything from emergency housing to housing for working families who are having a hard you know 
mm-hmm. set up to find housing that fits you know, within their income level. And um, there's different strategies for each group. Obviously, the, you know, for, for lower income, you're looking more at subsidies or programs like the low income housing tax credit. When you're talking about workforce, that's probably a little more things, the kind of things that incentives might overcome the mountain, the barriers or some sort of partnership with the county and maybe we own land that we work with the developer. You know, so there's a different toolbox used depending on where you are in that continuum. So I'll make sure that we reflect that in here. Um, the continuum. Yeah, and I think we, you know, we certainly do in the Bowen study, you know, we did that study two or three years ago that looked at particular market segments and, and where there were um, shortages of housing or, um, you know, growth that was going to outpace the, the supply of housing, you know, and so we, we've done that in that study to kind of look at the different income groups, but yeah. I'm not, I want to make sure it's translated here, so yeah. we'll look at that. I think a more neutral term is probably, you know, something we should seek after only because to the point Diane made about the word affordable versus workforce and I'm, I'm hearing there's another word that the young millennials will prefer um, to, what's the oh, word what? they like what, what's the word they I, I can't think of it right I've heard it paintable housing. paintable housing which <laughs> you know so I mean you're talking about different market segments yeah. and you're talking about different degrees of again go back to housing equity yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, from homelessness on up to you know making sure you have an adequate workforce that can afford to live here um, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings either, but it, there is a, it's a huge spread in there, and you know some of it, like um, workforce housing, kind of gets rolled up into new urbanism a little bit. Whereas you know when you get down to the other end of the spectrum, it really doesn't get incorporated into some of the general concepts of of what us, all of us, and planners are trying to do, and and you know it's a social issue. Um, I don't know how much we can delve into that or not. I think portraying it as a continuum acknowledges that there are differences in the needs for housing in different segments. Well, I think that's you know that's a great point because I mean with the shortage of inventory, mm -hmm. you know, affordable housing could be like my son who's 24 is looking to buy a house because it'll be cheaper than renting an apartment. Mm -hmm. Seriously, so uh, he could buy a hundred eighty-six thousand dollar home and have a cheaper monthly payment than to rent an apartment in Buford, and that's the reality. Hmm, that's you know, interesting. It's the truth. It's and so true affordable that my son, housing um, had the same experience in Bluffton. I mean, he was paying more to rent an right. apartment than yep. if he was able to qualify. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If you if you can do that, then his actually monthly payments are less buying a small duplex. Right. So I'm helping him get you know the down payment for a house because in the long run it's going to be cheaper for him and so you know the the concept of affordable housing to a kid who is is you know gainfully employed making good money no debt housing is still not affordable for him <laughs> so I mean it's 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 a, that's, that's harder to accept in that in that but and I I agree but I mean right. it's harder to accept but I mean. I can remember back when we were buying our first house. It wasn't easy, right? Right, but it's it's you know that's the reality of, of living in paradise here. You know, it just yeah. and and there is a shortage of inventory of of houses right now in Buford. I guess you can decide not to live in paradise. You have to find a place instead of paradise. <laughs> All right, um, we're back. Can't live just back to me again. So, um, so. Page 62, um, the strategies and actions at the end of affordable housing. On the inventory side, um, H3.5, consider prohibiting short-term rentals as the pro primary use of the property in certain residential areas. That is potentially only the 4% or so that is people who live as their primary residence. Is that like the Airbnbs? Yeah, and VRBOs. What page are you on, Susan? Um I'm sorry, it's page 62. 62. I mean, we've had this discussion before it's that that in neighborhoods, people find it very difficult, and, and Randolph made certain points, and all of us have had have weighed in. I've weighed in about my neighborhood. I do think that's a, um, an actually very tenable solution for people at 4% who you know, want to, to rent. So thank you for that. 
And my question was, to what degree, I know Charleston's been struggling with it and um, has, I think, put a moratorium for six months or something. I, I'm not sure how many properties that will um, add to the inventory, and it may, again, just be long-term rental properties. Um, but I just think that's such a good point and I would not, and such a, you know, a tool that I would not want it to get lost in the much more complex issue of affordable housing. Well, this, this was looked at by both the MPC and the BCPC yeah. on two separate, on several occasions. And, you know, I think the challenge is going to be there's people who live and work up north they own property, they're not ready to retire, so they'll come down here periodically, and while the house is sitting empty, they'll rent it out to families attending a Paris Island graduation. So that's, I think, where that kind of bubbled up. But yeah, the um, Airbnb market has really grown in popularity um, nationwide, but particularly in this area, which does reduce the inventory of, you know, sure. but some of those wouldn't be long-term rentals anyway, because the folks that own them do want to come down at some point throughout the year and you know so they wouldn't be interested in signing a 12 to 36 month lease you know to a, a prospective tenant anyway there's some wiggle room there the four right. four to six percent is one piece of wiggle room you know resident the kind of certain neighborhoods is another piece of wiggle room you know the policy goal of putting more inventory into the housing market I mean yeah. I, I think there's some real opportunity what other communities are doing um, Anyway, yeah. I just think it's a thank you very much. Yeah. And um, I think just to go places like Charleston, where you have, it's it's more lucrative to to do a short term rental sure. than it is to just simply mm -hmm. have a you know the house inhabited. I think. Mm -hmm. So it, it affects the community in more ways than than just the housing cost. But yeah, well, I think Hilton Head. I mean, there have been stories very recently in the paper about um, how they're trying to manage it, which is mm -hmm. at this moment not very successful. Um, I want to go back to something Ed said. I was shuffling here because I couldn't find it. But I think your whole point about um, the vulnerability index mm -hmm. is really well taken. I mean, I couldn't find where I had actually, because I had to look back and figure out what the definition was. I think it's important, and, and I guess um, from my point of view out on St. Helena, and I, and I really praise um, Rob and Noah um, and the St. Helena plan folks, um, I think the, what we've come up with out there is the sense of entrepreneurship and opportunity. And we've really focused on that aspect, as well as vulnerability of, you know, of housing or you know, a school that is not the best school in the county. But there is an emphasis in that community now, more articulated than it's been in these kinds of documents, about um, opportunities, like for, cottage, for home businesses, for cottage businesses, for adjusting um, the amount of land required in a um, designated family compound and, and the tax benefits that flow from that. Um, you're making it easier to consolidate land under heirs' property. All these kinds of things, while they address it, you know, possibly a, a, a compromised or a vulnerable uh, population, they really are um, very good examples of the county uh, encouraging entrepreneurship and helping um, individuals lift themselves up. I think that's, that's important to use terms that are uplifting, <laughs> like opportunity, entrepreneurship. I, you know, I agree, equi totally. Equi yeah. Equitable opportunity improvement. Yeah. Uh, as opposed to teams that, uh, terms that seem to be uh, downgrading negative, or, yeah. or negative or seem to be, uh, to may be offensive. Yeah, another example, and I forget what page it was on, uh, one of the last options was, um, you know, create a brochure that would uh, <coughs> indicate counties, <coughs> pardon me, support, I think it was heirs' property for one, but <coughs> other kinds of land uses and how to um, make sure or measure that your property is resilient, you know, storm, water, storm surge, et cetera, et cetera. And the way that paragraph was phrased, I thought was also very, very good. So I think the the theme is here, and I think the language is here. But like Ed, just give it one more review with, with the um, consult to make sure that our language is completely consistent with these themes. Um, I wanted to, on page 53, the prioritized bicycling and walking to connect residents as a cyclist I really love seeing this <laughs> and um, yeah if we can have more 
bicycle friendly roads, that would be incredible. I mean, the Spanish Moss Trail is great, um, but you know, other, other areas, uh, and I know there's a lot of cyclists down in the Bluffton area, um, and that area tends to be more cycle friendly. Um, so I love this portion of, of the plan, so thank you. <laughs> Okay. So you'll be seeing shortly, um, we're working on a bicycle pedestrian plan for the county. And the, the entire county. county municipality. Yeah. So Fantastic. that'll dovetail into these yeah. recommendations. There's so a lot of discussion about that. I thought you couldn't extend the Spanish Moss Trail because of the, the bridge during the last hurricane was um, um, the one to connect it to Yemisee. Yeah, it, it's, it's going to be more of a challenge because <laughs> not only is, is that bridge I think it was taken out because there's a swing it bridge over the whale branch yep. yeah in addition the right away north of the whale branch river is that is uh the surface rights are deeded to a conservation group whose sole purpose is to keep it from developing into a trail <laughs> so we really would have to look at a kind of a culture you know a shift in in, in attitudes about the bike trail and that, that may happen over time Right. The popularity of the Spanish Moss Trail, but isn't that interesting? Yeah, yeah. it was. Um, <laughs> Dean Moss can tell you that it was kind of a compromise we had to that he had to work through when he was working for Buford Jasper Water Sewer Authority to keep check these large property owners uh, challenging <laughs> the, the well. acquiring the right of way. So. So. Well, thank you for that. That's that's great, um, and I th and I see a lot more cyclists again at like 4:45. there's people on their bicycles going to work and i was amazed at the number of people i run into that are you know they're, they're using it for transportation so yeah it's uh what you'll see in our bike pad plan it's good for so many different reasons you know, yes. for health for alternative mode of transportation for recreation and you know so it's it's definitely a something that we're, we're hoping to see more of in the future yeah Thank it's you. come it's come a long way i mean <laughs> mm -hmm. i can re i can remember the day i think it was bob stadhoff oh yeah initiated a well let's have a bike trail somewhere in beaufort county uh, back in around 2002 2003 mm -hmm. and it was a lot of work being done and it's taken a long time to progress to where we are but it, it, it's it's demonstrated that it's of extreme value to the residents uh, not only at the Spanish Moss Trail, but trails all over the county. Mm -hmm. So I, I applaud that too. Yeah. That Spanish Moss Trail gets a lot of traffic. Yeah, you I, know, I see people on it all the time. Walkers, <laughs> cyclists, you know, runners. During the pandemic, I would actually take detours. It was so crowded. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> it was during the shutdown. <laughs> so it's a, a victim of its own success. That's right. <laughs> Okay. All right. My, my next comment is um, th throughout the document, I was constantly reminded about how much water it makes up Beaufort County. Mm -hmm. um, and this becomes extremely clear when you read the atlas and see all the data on lowlands and marshes and tidal lands and just the ocean and its estuaries all around the county. And, and, and in that vein, I came to think about maybe we should make a stronger emphasis on marine transport or the use of the waters. I know the folks on Tefusky Island have expressed <laughs> the, the desire to have more emphasis on marine transport to and from their island. And I see the opportunities here need to be examined, whether we're talking ferry service, we're talking water taxi, we're talking fishing pier access, we're talking more marina access, more boat kayaking, kayaking areas. Um, we should take a closer look at, at how are we going to use half of our county, which is water, and add value, to, because it is value, uh, to the, uh, the citizens of Beaufort County by making better use of our waterways. Not just to use them, but to protect them and preserve them. And so I, I would like to see a stronger emphasis to the mobility segment that begins on page 47 for water access uh, expanding marine access and transport services like ferry services, water taxi services, public dockage services, marinas, kayak launches, fishing piers, given a full examination of those opportunities. 
we did have some language in the existing conference of plan that addresses it. And mm -hmm. so very minimal we can bring that forward, but I think we yeah. need to look at how to expand it a little bit. And there may have to be a service that's uh, you know provided by the county. Mm -hmm. um, there are other municipal other counties that do have uh, ferry service that's supported by county <laughs> county funding. And so I think it's real something we might want to consider to connect our distant islanding communities. I mean, how far is it from Hilton Head to Beaufort by water? Depends on the weather. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And whether or not you get seasick, I guess. <laughs> um, okay, that that was my comment. Diane, Jason. No, I do want to come in um, the county for. I mean, it's easy to get wrapped up in the little things that you know one need and want to be adjusted. But it's a really nice looking document, and it's a lot of hard work, and I, I appreciate it very much. Mm, it's gorgeous. Kevin? Um, no, no, I'm, I'm good. I'm, I'm, I'm impressed with the document. I, I agree with, on the maps. I think there's a few things to, to kind of clean it up a bit. And um, I, I think we're in pretty good shape. Okay. Leslie? Um, I, I guess I'm going to go off topic a little bit and ask about um, your plans for messaging the document. You know, how, how what, what's the best way to make sure that the public is aware of a the document's assets, b not to be frightened of it, c not you know that it's going to take something away from them, and c that it's um, user friendly. I mean, I would think those are three very important messaging points. Um, however, you all do it, and is there a plan for that? Well, I mean, we've been trying to get the word out as much as possible to the public now that it is mm -hmm. online. Sure. Um, and so we've see received a lot of comments, but they've been. We have a little bit of an issue in one of the parts of the county, and they've been revolving around that particular issue, so we haven't had a lot of diversity of comments yet. Some of the ways that we're hoping to do that, um, and I realize this messaging is, is important, but we want the document, part of the reason that we've, we've streamlined it and made it more get right into the strategies and actions rather than being a inch thick document with sure. a lot of background. That way people have a, an opportunity to really hone in on you know, what are the county's economic development strategies and actions. So that you know, part of it is just in arranging a document, we want it to be much easier to convey that. And we have also, and I realize it's still kind of in the construction phase where we're, we're working on this action matrix, or I think they call action playbook, and that is to get you know, we have strategies um, that are more telling us perhaps how to make future decisions. And then actions are things that you can actually take action and check off a box and say you did, or, or it's an ongoing thing. And so our goal is also to, is to have those actionable items um, listed in a matrix format, prioritized, um, and be something that could be tracked. And, and so, you know, in those yeah. ways, we're hoping to keep this a living document. Mm -hmm. and that, that's always a danger with comprehensive plans is they, they look pretty and then... Sure. I mean, as Ed said, you know, yeah. to, to, to strengthen the work plan aspect of this. I think that's great. I, I guess when I say in messaging, I mean, not only do that, excellent, but convey that aspect of the plan. Because I think a lot of people have been in strategic planning processes either as a volunteer or in their workplace and like, oh, another strategic plan is going to sit on the shelf. You know. So I, I very much, I, I really do think this document is already um, dynamic. And um, just to keep reinforcing that it is something suggesting actionable items, trackable items, receiving more input. Um, I was a little skeptical at the beginning. I thought it was going to be too squishy. And uh, I think I shared that with you. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, I was very um, yeah. concerned about that. And I um, am extremely pleased that I was proven wrong. Um, you know, I, I, I think this is a fantastic document. I, I, can't, I can't state that enough. Um, but two of the biggest things that we struggle with on the planning commissions are traffic and environment. Mm -hmm. And I, I didn't see a lot of that in here, and I know it. You know, we can't 
have that level of granularity um, on those topics in a document like this, but I thought it should be, you know, more more deeply stated. That that's one of our, our key concepts because of the workshops that you held both in Beaufort and in Bluffton, you know, I went to, I think I went to most of them, um, and, and you surveyed people. That kept coming up as, you know, recreation, environment, um, yeah. you know, the, the um, <clears throat> Did I just say the environment, the um, traffic? traffic mm -hmm. You know, th those are those are concerns. They're at the top of the concerns for the citizens of Beaufort County, and I just thought I would see it more kind of laced in this document more. Yeah. So, yeah, the, we sort of chose to go a little bit of it. I mean, we do in this. Uh, there's a kind of three themes that weave through the document: yes. the, the equity, mm -hmm. the um, resilience, and yes. place making. Right. Right. And the resilience really deals a lot with the environmental issues. Mm -hmm. But you're right, we, we don't really, we haven't addressed transportation as a major theme, but it's definitely very dominant in the document. Right. Um, I mean, I can see that it's thought of because you're talking about trolley systems and bus routes and maybe water, you know, water routes and all that's mm -hmm. great, you know, to kind of um, alleviate some of the traffic um, concerns that we have and already on Ladies Island there's they're implementing the Ladies Island plan with the new turn lane coming off Sam, Sam's Point Road mm -hmm. and all that's great in its progress but I just you know as our ethos you know um, those are the, the topics that I think resonated with most of the citizens of Beaufort County is you know let's protect our environment yep. um, let's keep traffic you know uh, manageable and um, you know have a safe you know healthy place to live you know, so well, you one come. of the things that and I, I'm you know I've been here long enough that I, and I've heard those themes in the <laughs> last 20 years one thing I do like about this plan and I think that's something that we haven't played up enough is the issue of equity and trying to look at right. is Beaver County a good place for all to live or is it a better place for you know people who are higher up in the socioeconomic ladder than those who are struggling. And I I do applaud the consultant for maybe, it's not that we don't think that traffic is, is as important as it's always been, but I think it's taken a look at, there are perhaps some other issues that we need to, um, when we look at the impact of growth and all the changes in our county that we need to look at. Um, you know, so I think that that's maybe the counter to it is that we're still, we put a lot of importance on traffic because that's obviously the way, you know, with, with growth, that's the number one thing that really hits us is if we're having to sit in traffic longer. But there are these other things that, that have happened around the county, you know, with, with social equity that, you know, maybe we're, the lower invisible, but they're, they're really important and they, they affect the lives of many of our residents. And so. You know, maybe it's just a, a reshifting of the focus, but not not saying that those things are not as strong as issues as they've always been. Yeah, I, I think you have all the components in the documents that have been created. Um, the green print plan, it mm -hmm. certainly goes into extreme amount of detail about the need to protect the environment, identifying all of the areas and the issues for connectivity, for protection of lowlands, etc. Um, that needs to be and is intended to be integrated with the comprehensive plan so that, that there's a collaboration always sought between the environmental issues on one hand and the development issues on the other mm -hmm. as you look at every piece of property increasing there's a less of an inventory of property and so the criticality of using that property either to, to preserve and protect or to develop and to what degree I think is laid out very clearly um, in the green print plan and in, um, and can be cross-referenced very easily to the comp plan. It's going to be very important to make that very clear message. Mm -hmm. And so messaging becomes, again, a critical point. Um, in, in today's environment, we're using webinars all over the place. Um, I would encourage the county uh, in working with other organizations, uh, maybe environmental organizations, construction, building uh, organizations, to take a look at um, 
explaining and integrating these two documents and how they're going to work together as can give an example of how that can happen. Uh, because again, if we don't use those documents that portray very, that are very factual based on how we go forward, then we've done it all for nothing. Mm -hmm. um, and so again, the messaging becomes very clear and anybody can, once you quit creating a webinar, it's there forever. And you can always use it in, in any time that you want. If your particular interests come up in a particular area, to, to consult the webinar about the documents that are pertinent to your issue, I think that's important. Are there any other comments? Um, I have a couple of things that were just um, corrections or questions. Um, things like um, including the 2021 FEMA flood guidelines, updating the document for that. Um, we do make reference to it when we talk about the importance of additional freeboard because our flood maps have gone down in elevation. Yeah. Yep. So I mean, it, it, it's addressed in, in, the, um, in one of the action items that maybe we could talk about. I mean, if, if, do you feel that it needs to be a little more prominent to the documents? Well, on, on page 24, it, lists, it makes reference to the documents. Um, and that one, and it gives a chronological order and development of the documents that demonstrates, uh, let me turn to page 24. Page 24. There was a compendium of documents that were referenced. Oh. Uh, maybe it was in the atlas. Okay. Yeah, uh, 24 and 25. But, it, but it, I thought it, it might be pertinent to also include it in here, is, yeah, it, and that the discussion of flooding and all that takes place as to ensure that people are aware of the 2021 FEMA okay. guidelines. We'll make sure. We wrote the, the, a lot of the atlas language was written about six months prior to this, and so there might be a few gotcha. items like that that might need updated. So we'll take a look at that. All right. Um, again, if, if, if you have comments that as a result of this discussion that you'd like to amplify on um, or things that you want to send forward, I would encourage you to do that uh, to Rob. He will share them with uh, the consultant organization. I know they're going to pour through all these for the next 30 days. You want to talk a minute about the, the game plan going forward here? What's our next task? Well, um, what we're doing, you know, at the uh, April Planning Commission meeting, that was kind of an unveiling of the plan. And so at that same time, we um, put out a public notice to all the, you know, the county's mailing list, letting them know that the plan was out there. We gave people, I, Libby, do you remember what the date was? It was May, uh, I think May 9th. We gave people a deadline to get comments in the staff. Mm -hmm. um, we also sent, the plan to each of the, the, the relevant uh, county department directors, to um, municipal planners, to other people in the community who've been very active in the planning world, um, such as Coastal Conservation League and the Open Land Trust and some various environmental groups. Um, and so we're hoping to hear back from the public from all this input, and then we will develop in addition to the comments from the Planning Commission, a matrix of comments, and its staff will sit down and come up with how we want to address each of the recommendations or comments that were made. You know, I would hope that most of them will, will take, you know, take to heart and make edits. Some of them may be that they're addressed somewhere else so we can provide clarity. You know, some we, from the public, you know, we may just have to say staff disagrees. We'll bring that back to the planning commission to review, and we may want to set a workshop date maybe in May to do that. Once we agree on the edits we want to make to the, the document after the planning commission has had a look at it, we'll send those off to our consultants to make the changes and come up with a final draft that we will the goal is to have that for the, the June Planning Commission meeting where we'll have a public hearing. So it's, a, it's an ambitious schedule, but that's, that's the timeline. <laughs>
So then at the June meeting uh, with the public hearing, would that be a final recommendation from the Planning Commission? Is that, that's how we would conclude that? We could either take action at that June meeting or it could be that the Planning Commission, you know, based on the public hearing, they may want to have the public hearing and then take action at the July meeting. You know, I think that's something that... Okay. Planning I, I believe that we may have a month off with the Natural Resources Committee, which I think gives us a little more room to work with. There's, I don't think there's any rush to make a decision at the June meeting before wanting to send it off to Natural Resources and County Council, because I think because of the summer, they may or may not have a meeting scheduled. A lot of times in July, they'll either go down to one or no meetings with these committees. Okay. So the next step is basically a review by the consultant. Um, well, once we get our comments, the consultant will make the changes right, and then we'll get a revised document. Okay. Are there any comments or questions about the next steps here? Anything more on this issue? Well, the May um, workshop date, would that be um, in conjunction with our planning commission meeting? Or would that be a separate event? I think it would have to be a separate event because we're giving people till the 9th right, to come Right, it comes too soon. Okay. And so we'll, we'll already have the, the May meeting. Yeah. Yeah, and the, our May meeting is before that. <laughs> but we could pick another, you know, maybe a Tuesday afternoon. Okay. Later on in May. <laughs> Oh, boy, why not? Tuesday afternoons are good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See, you work for us today. That's <clears throat> the only uh, final comment that I, I'd offer up, and, and this, uh, Diane, correct me if I'm wrong about this, is the um, APA conference still open for registrations? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so far by now. Okay. So I know that there are four of the commissioners have signed up for the APA three day conference of extensive webinars and <laughs> what's that the, the APA conference is a national uh, planning association work uh, conference that is being held digitally this year and over a three-day period they provide a compendium of uh, issues pertinent to planning organizations and county officials uh, relative to many of the issues that are in our comprehensive plan affordable housing where do I find it um, in here? It's not in there. It's, it's not, not in there. It's not personal. Oh, okay. It's just a separate issue. Um, well, I, we can talk about that. Um, and so I would encourage you, if you're interested in that, um, if you sign up for the program as it's being offered by the county, you have up to June 30th to view any of the videos. So you don't have to pour over eight hours of three days worth of videos. <laughs> Yeah. And there's, I think there's a library of about 300 videos that they open up to you. Mm -hmm. I've been through the first four or five pages and my head's swimming. <laughs> <laughs> it's like being in a candy shop. Which one will I take? <laughs> I will say, you know, that will offer, if, you know, there are probably 30 different sessions to attend at the conference. And if you're only interested in one or two, we could probably arrange for, for one, you know, staff will have registered, you know, if you're interested in seeing, you know, we could probably arrange to have you come to the office. Right. And, and oh, yeah. The, the great hours. idea. It all counts towards your training. Yeah. Which is always good. Yes. That's, that's always important. All right. Anything else for the good of the cause? If not, I'll I deem this meeting adjourned. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman.